right, people of We All Stand Together, the magazine, my very special guest here this afternoon after the Beatle Fest. He was very kind to join me, Mr. Sam Leach, promoter for quite a few groups. And you can plug your book if you right. like. How can I get Bye. <laughs> this is his new book. Both of the Beatles. And maybe you can tell me a little bit about that. Well, ask me well, some tell questions. Tell me a lot about that. Well, ask me some questions. Ask me, have you read it yet? Oh, sure, sure. Okay, yeah. Um, well, tell me about the groups you promoted. Like well, the first time I met the Beatles, it would be a good start, wouldn't it? Yes, it would. Yeah. That's um, mainly what we're talking about. I had a couple of clubs, and I needed new talent, you know. And they'd been to Hamburg, and they weren't very good before they went away. So I went along to a very rough hall called Hamilton Hall on the outskirts of Liverpool. And it was like a war zone, teddy boys fighting and that kind of stuff back. I mean, if CNN had been invented then, they'd have been there, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, I was about to go. I heard this William Tell Overture, classical music, and I thought, what's that getting played at a rock show for? I turned around, and Bob Wooler's voice said, it's the Beatles! The curtains fell apart. Well, they were, they were de decomposing anyway. And there they were, five black leather clad figures, you know, bouncing into my life. John started straight away with Slow Down. And then Paul jumped in with Hippie Hippie Shake. Then George weighed in with um, Henry VIII, the novelty song. That was quite funny. Mm. And then it bounced around like that, and the, sh the, the sound, it just absolutely. There's no, even though the pool was full of talent, there was nothing coming out of them at that time. And I couldn't believe what I was saying. And you know, the non stop show, the fighting stopped. Even the dancers stopped dancing, they were just watching, awestruck. Really? Gobsmack is a new word that we use in Liverpool. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the sound didn't seem to go over your head, it went right through you. It was fantastic. And I've always said that the world had never saw the Beatles as I saw them in those early days. They were very raw, uninhibited. And uh, when Epi came along, he groomed them, you know, took out something which, uh, unfortunately for the rest of the world, they never saw the way I saw. Right. Because I think at that moment, <coughs> they were probably the best rock band on the planet. Anyway, after the show, um, Pete Best was the drummer down and Stuart Sutcliffe was on bass, if you want to call it, on right, bass. Right, yeah, right. All right. Yeah, I know that yeah, story. I yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, try, I'll let them know it. Anyway, um, I followed them into the dressing room, which really was a lady's totally converted. <laughs> I walked in behind John and Paul, and I said to John, I said, you know what, well, lads, I didn't know the names then. I said, you were going to be as big as Elvis one day. And John laughed, looked at me, and he said, another, no another we got here, Paul. And Paul said, yes, but I know he's got a lot of work for us. And I gave him ten bookings that first night. Wow. Yeah. And then the f they made the debut for me about a fortnight later at the Casanova Club. And um, <coughs> I, I didn't like the way Stuart Sutcliffe used to play with his back to the audience. Oh, really? And the real reason, as I found out, yeah. that he couldn't play very well. I used to hide it from the audience. He'd be like a bit embarrassed that he couldn't see what he, what he wasn't doing rather than what he was doing. And halfway through the set, they, they were going down a bomb the Beatles every year. And George is playing an instrumental, uh, Moonglow. And it's very hard, he's biting his lip, <laughs> the lights are down, it's a lovely, smooth, sentimental song to do in the creep. And I see a jack plug on the floor. So I thought, oh, I put that in, and I plugged it into the amplifier, which was Stuart's amplifier. It looked a brand new amplifier, which, which it was. And the sound that came out, one Stuart was going this innocently, thinking it won't be heard. Well, I plugged it in. The sound that came out, you can imagine ten cats getting run over by a lorry, oh and then the lorry reversing back over them. <laughs> that was somehow approaching the sound. It certainly wasn't in key. It was in no key. The lost chord. Well, Paul jumped across the stage, yanked the plug out, said, you fool, Leachy, don't know he can't play. Well, that was okay to set it to me, except <coughs> this, it came out over the amplifier system in the club. And everybody in the club heard it. Oh boy. 
And George gave me a growl, a look like, why are you spoiling my instrumental? He clearly struggling with it, you know. And you can imagine how embarrassed Stuart was. I was even more embarrassed. But other than that, it was a great night, you know. And um, where were we? Well, Paul and Stu always had, uh, yeah. they, they had a friction, didn't they? No, they didn't really. Paul was, was understanding. But, wasn't but it Paul amazing? knew. Yeah, that he couldn't play. And really, it was an extra mouth to feed kind of thing, you know, as, as bookings are concerned. And eventually, Paul took off the bass, as you know, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but Stuart was John's mate. And what had happened, Stuart was a very good artist, and he'd won a competition, and he'd won £60, which in those days was a lot of money. It would be like £500 today. And uh, the jump is paid him. They needed an amplifier on the Beatles, and John was waiting to buy an amplifier. And she was okay, I'll buy an amplifier, but I want to be in the group. So that was how he got in the group. <laughs> but he added something because uh, it was like a James Dean. Right. And the girls were very impressed with him, very quiet and blasted, and he looked for the part, you know. Well, he so he, he died very young. Yeah. Was there any. He, he got, I believe, he got, a, he got beat up at Latham Hall, which wasn't my dance. Brian Kelly didn't have, Brian never had enough bounces, and he got attacked in the car park. And John um, saw Stuart getting attacked in the car park, ran out, hit a fellow so hard, it damaged his wrist, and he couldn't play the guitar for about a fortnight. Wow. He was upset, John, that night. I got, I wasn't there. I got told this by John, in actual fact. And uh, about two years later, Stuart died, probably as a result of the kicking. He is, could easily have been that. I don't know that for sure, but it's possible, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Because otherwise. I'm you're awful young and healthy, yeah. and, of course. and you go down like that. Yeah. So anyway, the Beatles started playing me for a lot. Uh -huh. And <clears throat> the cabin at that time was a jazz club. And John Lennon once had the quarry man years before, played a rock number and got told off. Rory Storm played a whole lot of shaking going on. And he got fined a pound out of his wages for oh. singing a rock song. Oh. This, is, this is in the cabin where it all began, folks, you know. Yeah. Anyway, um, they had the Beatles on twice on a Tuesday night, but that was for the Blue Jeans, Blue Jeans guest night, and where Raymond Ford had nothing to do with that, because he just didn't like rock and roll, hated it, as did most adults, you know. Me, I was a rock and roll fan, you know. It was a new thing. I was a fan, yeah. Well, I was in from the beginning, you know. Uh -huh. I've been running dancing for four years, but um, I was just a, a promoter, but really was a rock and roll fan. Pretending to be a promoter, you know. <laughs> anyway, the all night session, it, it, March the 11th, 1961, had 12 groups on, 12 hours, right throughout the night. And we had 2,000 people in a club that only held 1,100. Wow. And how we did it, at 12 o'clock, the younger kids would go home to get the last bus. Right. And then the drinkers and the older people would come <laughs> in after 12. So we had them queuing like a, like a cinema. <laughs> second house. Wow. Anyway, um, that night we had 2,000, just under 2,000, I think it was 1,900 and something. And I found out a couple of years later that Kevin had uh, 50 people in that night. So Ray McFaul got the message in a big way. And 11 days later, March 21st, he began running rock and roll at night. Because obviously his club was empty, jazz was over, you know. Right. And I forced him, I dragged him. Kicking and screaming into Mersey Beat Age. <laughs> the young kids loved it. Well, that's why Paul McCartney called it Sam Leach era. Because John Lennon said um, Sam Leach was the pulse of Mersey Beat. What he did, the rest copied, which is true, you know. Right. Mark Lawson. Um, I'm very proud. I'm not being big headed. I'm just very proud of these comments, you know, as you would be. Sure. Mark Lawson said um, Sam Leach ran his promotions in uh, a grand American style. Um, that's a compliment to America, of course. Yeah. I was the best smoker in the world then. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, running his shows and... Uh, oh, I was the most adventurous promoter of Mersey Society, so... So that I accept that. <laughs> well, I understand you were responsible for getting Brian Epstein and Alistair Taylor to the Cavern Club. Well, as it turned out, not willingly. Uh -huh. uh, when I was doing Operation Big Beat at the Tower, this is near the end of 61, um, about the middle of October, Nemesis used to sell tickets for me at the ticket agency. They were one of the agents. 
And the girl in the White Chapel branch, Van had two shops, said, um, I'll go to the new shop. And she probably said Mr. Epstein, but I didn't uh, remember her saying her name. So I went in at this little shop, very small, smaller than this room, believe it or not, the second shop. And this very smart dressed gentleman is on a ladder, putting a poster on at an angle. I thought, that looks good, you know, it looks very effective. But I keep that in mind, you know. <laughs> Comes down the ladder, looking down his nose at me, you know. <laughs> Can I help you, sir? This kind of public school boy. Right. If you know Michael York, oh, well, yes, yeah, I do. well, that's how happy he had the same accent. Oh, yeah, okay. exactly okay. the same accent, right. So I told him what I was coming for. I did posters and the tickets, and the Beatles all over it, all of the tickets, handbills. And well, why is our name on these posters? So I said, well, you've been selling tickets for me at other shows that I did, you know. He said, I don't think so. I said, oh, you have. So he wasn't going to take the tickets. And he said, in fact, I don't really want the other shops selling them. Didn't want to be associated with rock and roll. He huh. <coughs> didn't say that in as many words, <laughs> but you knew anybody over 25 right. hated rock and roll with a vengeance. <laughs> it just seemed the rule, you know. But he wasn't 25, but he looked it, you know. Right. Anyway, um, so I went to go. And when he said, take him out to the other shop, I said, oh, we can't do that, because that was an important shop for me. It was kind of a, a meeting place for all the people, you know. He's going to listen to records there. Right. So I started telling how good the Beatles were, and the show, and the other groups, without realising I was probably pricking his interest. <laughs> I've got further proof on that. Anyway, eventually he said, all right then, well, we'll see. I'll keep my eye on it. So I went, didn't like him very much. Uh, and he, I said, oh, I'm Sam Leach. And he said, oh, yes, I'm uh, Brian Epstein. He actually said, I'm Epstein. Brian Epstein, I thought my James <laughs> Bond. <laughs> I thought that was his James. I thought James Bond had been invented then. But, I but it's funny how you said it, you know. So I liked him actually. Anyway, uh -huh. um, at that time, a, a week later, he's asking for more tickets. Not to me, to the girl into the shop, and I had to take him up. And he sold 300 tickets in the, in the two shops. He also sold 200 copies of Mosebeat with Beatles all over the cover. Wow. And he even wrote in Mersey Beat. And Lennon wrote in Mersey Beat. Right, right. Now you're telling me that he didn't catch on that something was happening. Of course he did. Because this Raymond Jones, who was supposed to have asked for a record, well, if he existed, where is he? Alistair Taylor, though. Is well, is I'll tell you about Alistair Taylor. Okay. <clears throat> in Chicago, 91, I'm having this debate on stage proving that I was, uh, uh, Raymond Jones didn't exist. And Alistair wouldn't have it. You know, I've met him, I've met him. So I said, I don't think so. So I won the debate. And Alistair got a bit cubby, annoyed over it. But on the way home, he must have been thinking, Sam's probably right, I've, I've never met him. So the next thing, he writes the book in which Alistair's claiming that he was Raymond Jones. Now I swear, I've got it on tape. In fact, I never got the tape off Mark. Mark's got it. Really? In, in Chicago it was. And it's on tape. An, so we can an audio get, tape? Yeah, an audio tape. So somewhere there's proof of what he's, you know. My goodness. But forget that, I'm not going to embarrass Alistair uh -huh. by blowing that little bit of a lie out of the water. I'm not, and Alistair's okay, I like him, you know. Yeah, I've met him. Nice little fellow. Very, very nice. Anyway, I've recently heard, within the last ten days, there's a fellow came come forward on Radio Merseyside claiming to be Raymond Jones. Oh my God. Well, that probably is his name. <laughs> but I'm quite sure there's quite a few Raymond Joneses. Wow. And if, if it was him, he can't have the proof, because Alistair is already giving another version sure. that he was Alistair jo uh, Ray Raymond Jones. Um, why did it take 40 years to come forward? So I'm taking that with a pinch of salt. 